You write that the don't ask, don't tell policy was the result of a bitter battle over the acceptability of homosexuality in the United States. Is that a battle that the gays and lesbians have lost? I don't think that we've lost it. I think it was um, not framed adequately in the early 90s, and there was a, we really underestimated the opposition to this issue. Um, you know, progress is always two steps forward and one step back, and I think that's what we're seeing now in California, and we'll continue to see that. Well, what did it change for gays uh, who wanted to serve in the military? Some still are in the military, even though the policy is in effect, isn't, aren't they? Well, that's part of what I found. I mean, there have always been gays in the military, and everyone acknowledges that. In fact, this policy, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, was a formal acknowledgement of that, while at the same time it said, we can't let them admit it. We can't let them speak about it. And so I also found that not only do gays serve, but they serve openly already. And so the very assumptions of this policy are off. They're false. You know, the idea that if we let gays serve openly, the military would crumble or there would be problems in the units is, is false. It suggests that there is a lack of discipline in the military that people just can't uh, live side by side without um, somehow influencing each other. Well, it's certainly a vote of no confidence in the troops. So for those social conservatives who claim that this is about national security and military effectiveness and they say our troops couldn't handle this, um, you know, that's both both untrue and also it represents a, uh, the idea that they don't think, you know, that, that their troops can, can follow order. Wasn't it the result of a compromise between President Clinton and the military? Sure. It was a compromise that pleased virtually no one. Um, Clinton had made promises during his campaign that he would lift the ban. And he was told by some people that it would be easy, more or less, that he could basically do it with the stroke of a pen, which is what Truman had done in 1948 to desegregate the military by executive order. But when Clinton got into office, uh, the issue kind of spiraled out of control. There, there are people who think that, you know, he made this the first priority. He did underestimate how tough it would be, but it was the press and it was social conservatives who made a fuss about it. And then he found himself having to defend it and defend it, and he lost. Well, what did proponents of Don't Ask, Don't Tell argue the policy was going to accomplish? That The idea was that it would try to make sexuality into a non-issue by saying, okay, let's be realistic and let's try to be fair. Gays serve in the military. They do so effectively. Uh, but when you talk about it, when you admit it, wh when you're honest about it, somehow that undermines cohesion. There's never been any research showing that, but that was the way it was sold to the public. You argue that behind the scenes in 1993, senior military officers viewed the gay ban as a moral imperative and that even the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colin Powell, wrote up a moral argument against gays in the military. Is moral imperative a way of saying anti-gay? It is. I try in Unfriendly Fire to go into some detail to distinguish among the different views, feelings, and fears that different people at the table had. There was a, a, a vocal constituency of religious conservatives who just thought this is about godless sinners and we don't want our military and our government approving of that. Um, then there were those who just sort of appeased those people and said, more or less, we agree with you or that's fine, um, but we don't think the moral... The uh, moral frame is the best way to sell it to the public. So we're going to talk about it in terms of unit cohesion, discipline, and national security, and that's the way it was sold. But there were a number of different people with a number of different ideas. What carried the day was that fear, that homophobia, um, that m that narrow sort of moral intolerance, as I put it. It's the idea that someone who could look at you with eyes of desire somehow invades your privacy. I also go into the idea that the military is a kind of homosocial, even homoerotic environment. Surprisingly, this was actually discussed on the congressional floor by the military, by sociologists who had studied this, um, and it's one of the reasons for the ban, that, that if you acknowledge that gays are in the military, all of the kind of homoerotic bonding that's always been a critical part of the military is suddenly suspect in a way that it, it wasn't if it's kept under wraps. At least that's the thinking. Well, that, uh, I don't know whether we call it homoerotic, but that bonding doesn't have to be sexual bonding. In fact, um, uh, pretty much every soldier I've ever met told me that uh, he felt that all the people he served with were family. He loved them all. That's exactly right. It's not sexual bonding for the most part. Um, I think it highlights the fears around this issue um, and and also speaks to the confusion around love and sexuality in our culture, which is a big reason I took on this project. So what constitutes telling? Well, the law in general, and this policy in particular, um, 
has a gray area, and it has to because you you know, especially with this issue, because sexuality can be um, can be difficult to to define and difficult to identify. And so, what it says is anything that a reasonable person would interpret to mean that the person is likely to engage in homosexual conduct. It's very convoluted. It, it was an effort to to defend itself against legal challenges and to try to make it. Uh, you know, get around that type of thing, and that's why they use this construction. Well, how do you find out? Uh, do, do you have to tell somebody about your sexual preference? Or do, what happens if you tell a doctor in confidence or if you tell a relative? Even doctors and relatives have uh, turned people in, whether they're supposed to or not, and it varies by service. It varies by profession. Um, there's nothing in the policy that keeps a third party from asking you if you're gay. So, in other words... The policy said you won't be asked uh, at recruitment, at accession, but uh, it, it doesn't say that someone else can't ask you, and people are asked all the time in, in one way or the other, or it comes up. So I think a lot of people thought, well, maybe this is not too big of a sacrifice just to you know, say to gay people, why don't you keep it quiet? But they didn't realize what it meant to, to bend over backwards to keep quiet the most basic elements of your personal life, and that has come out not just when people volunteer it, but they have been found out.